is there a way we can get the number of Bitcoin nodes or downloads worldwide or per country? Uh, and what is the difference between reachable and non-reachable nodes? Zacharias, yes, there is a way you can get the number of Bitcoin nodes. Again, one of the places to go and look at that is a website called BitNodes. And it does show you, uh, among other things, it shows you an interactive map that you can zoom in, and it has little blue dots uh, for where there are Bitcoin nodes running. And as far as downloads worldwide, I believe that GitHub has certain statistics, but um, there are so many different ways you can download uh, Bitcoin from so many different sources that it's probably difficult to get an accurate number for downloads per country. Um, what is the difference between reachable and non-reachable nodes? Um, really, the difference is that some nodes uh, have open the Bitcoin port. So um, they basically advertise uh, access to the specific TCP port for Bitcoin. And that means that other computers can connect to them on the public internet. So their Bitcoin port is accessible on the public internet. Now, in order to do that, you need either a computer that is not behind a network uh, address translation system, uh, which is usually like a home wireless router or a home firewall. Those usually have network address translation, or a network address translation router that has um, universal plug and play or UPnP, so that it can open and forward ports inside. Uh, so you have to do a bit more setup to make your Bitcoin node be accessible from the public internet. A lot of people don't do that, and they don't do that for various concerns, including that they're advertising that they're running a Bitcoin node, so people can find that and correlate it with their IP address, which is not necessarily a big risk, but it does appear to be a concern. Um, or because it's technically more difficult, so they don't figure out how to do it. Then, of course, there's nodes that are deliberately hidden, and those are ones that are running on top of Tor, the onion routed network. And, um, Tor running Bitcoin nodes, which are running as they are called on Onion sites, are accessible over the Tor network, but nobody knows exactly where they are. So they go for another level of hiding. Nobody really knows uh, how many reachable versus non-reachable nodes there are. Uh, in order to find a non-reachable node, it has to reach out and connect to you. Um, or a node that's keeping track of IP addresses. And, um, there are some software projects that are attempting to count these by counting IP addresses that are found online. The, the bottom line is we estimate that there are approximately more than 10 times the number of non-reachable nodes than reachable nodes. Or let me just correct the terminology. The correct terminology is listening nodes versus non-listening nodes. So listening nodes are the ones that are reachable on the public internet. Non-listening nodes can make connections out. They're reachable in that direction, but they're not listening for connections coming in, uh, or they're not available on the public internet in that way. We estimate that for the 10,000 approximately listening nodes that exist today, there are more than 100,000 non-listening nodes. But again, it's very difficult to get an accurate number. Why did the number of Bitcoin nodes drop after March 2018? Um, Eric, I don't know which chart you're looking at, but I don't really see much of a drop. Probably, probably the best site for looking at Bitcoin nodes that I know of is called BitNodes. And what I'm looking at here is... Um, a peak of about 10,000 in March, and today's number is at 8,207. It's gradually declined, but not really by that much. My guess is that part of the reason the number of nodes goes up and drops is really um, reflective of the interest in cryptocurrencies and the interest in cryptocurrencies is 100% correlated to the exchange rate of Bitcoin. So price goes up, um, and everything goes up. Excitement, attendance of meetings, website hits, views of my YouTube shows, um, sign-ups for the MOOC, um, and of course, number of nodes that people start. Um, 
people try to start nodes to learn more about Bitcoin and want to participate. And then the price drops, people lose interest, and the number of nodes goes down. Um, so really, not that big a deal. Um, it's been around eight to ten thousand now for several years, and it doesn't vary that much. There seem to be kind of a core of um, dedicated users who are um, fairly persistent at running nodes, and most likely these nodes are related to professional uses and professional purposes. Um, and I think that that is why we saw a slight drop after March. Um, you know, there comes a point when the price goes down, when um, the people who were holding on for a couple of months, hoping for a rebound, finally give up, and that's what happened in March. Since the Bitcoin network highly depends on fully validating nodes, was there or will there ever be an option that will implement incentives for people that run full nodes? For Bitcoin or any other altcoin, um, Mirza, many other altchains do in fact have incentive schemes for running uh, for running nodes in various forms. Most of them through a process called proof of stake, but um, Bitcoin does not. So mostly, there's two reasons why you would run a full node, a fully validating node, not necessarily a full archive or full blockchain node. And um, the two reasons are one because you want to uh, contribute to the health of the network, and you want to be able to validate transactions authoritatively yourself because you don't want to trust the third party. So if I want to know if one of my invoices uh, that I made recently has been paid by one of my clients, I'm not going to trust the third party. I'm going to ask my own node if that transaction has been confirmed on the blockchain and that payment has been made. And my node, I know how it's configured, I know what consensus rules it's running, and therefore I trust that validation on my node. Um, the other reason people would run full nodes is because they're running a business. If you're doing e-commerce and you want to receive payments, you can't uh, trust. Well, you can trust third parties, but then you're not really participating in Bitcoin. Um, you might as well be doing PayPal. So by running a full node when you're running an e-commerce store or uh, when you're accepting large payments from clients or any other kind of business that depends on having an authoritative validating um, system, you are sure that a third party can't cheat you by presenting false information because you don't trust anyone. You validate your own uh, blockchain with the software that you choose to run according to consensus rules that you choose. Are nodes backwards compatible? If I have Bitcoin Core 014 and the latest version is 0.17, can I still function or am I forced to upgrade? Um, Gabriel, bottom line is, for the most part, uh, yes, nodes are very, very backwards compatible. In fact, that's one of the elements of conservative software development that allows you to validate uh, and to remain in sync with the network, even with a very old node. Part of the reason for that is the choice to do soft forks instead of hard forks in many cases, which allow old nodes to continue to operate on the network without making them um, incompatible with syncing the blockchain. The trade-off, however, is that um, older versions of Bitcoin Core, unless you upgrade them, may suffer from security vulnerabilities. So you say, if I have Bitcoin 014, uh, well, if if you have 014.0, which was released back then, you might have a problem. But um, Bitcoin is maintained for a couple of releases. So recently, for example, I believe 0.14.3 was released, which fixed the vulnerability was just discovered, and that's something you would want to upgrade at least that incremental release to fix the vulnerability. Um, your 014 nodes will continue to sync the blockchain. It's compatible. It will remain in sync. The other trade-off is that um, older nodes validate less, meaning that because of soft fork changes that have occurred, older nodes will see certain types of transactions and not fully validate the details behind them. In the case of uh, for example, segregated witness transactions, 
uh, a node 0 0.14, we'll see every segregated witness transaction as one that um, could be spent by anyone. It will misunderstand the script and think that anyone can spend it, uh, which in fact isn't the case, because the validation rules of SegWit prohibit that. Um, but it looks like a transaction that has much more loose rules to an old node, and that allows a node from 014 to validate a SegWit transaction um, without really validating the signature and continue to operate in sync on the network. And that way, it doesn't become uh, incompatible with the blockchain. That's a deliberate choice to do that as a soft fork, which we'll talk about in a second. Guy asked. What are the important differences to know about using a Lightning wallet compared to a regular Bitcoin wallet? Are there differences? And what is the difference between a Lightning node and a Lightning wallet? Um, that's a great question, Guy. And so, theoretically speaking, or if we have an ideal design, there is probably very little difference between the user experience of using a Lightning wallet and the user experience of using a Bitcoin wallet. Um, in both cases, the fundamental function of the wallet, which is showing you that you have a balance, uh, expressing that balance in different units, maybe uh, different cryptocurrency units. You have so many satoshi, so many bilibits, so many bits, so many micro bits, uh, whatever, uh, versus expressing it in a fiat currency. Your equivalent balance in U.S. dollars is X. That's a function of a wallet, and it would be the same in a Lightning wallet or a, a, a Bitcoin wallet. Um, whether um, you want to send or receive, in terms of receiving, a wallet will present a QR code that you can give to someone else, or an address that you can give to someone else. Um, and when you want to send, it can scan a QR code, or you can maybe paste uh, an address that you've received through some other channel and send to that. Address and then when you decide you want to send, you decide how much you want to send, um, and uh, what fee you want to pay. Well, in 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 those cases, a Lightning wallet looks really very similar. So, if you want to receive uh, money with a Lightning wallet, you have to say how much you want to receive, and then it will generate a QR code or um, a long address. Uh, which is actually called uh, a lightning invoice, uh, but it looks just like a long Bitcoin address. It's slightly longer than a traditional Bitcoin address. Uh, it's about two and a half times longer. And if you give that to someone else, they can make a payment to you. So in that way, it's not different than here's my Bitcoin address, pay me. It's here's my lightning invoice, pay me. One of the big differences, however, at least in the current stage of lightning, is that. People can only pay you if you generate an invoice, and you have to generate an invoice for a specific amount, which means you have to have an interactive step there. You can't simply give them a lightning address and say, pay me whatever you want, whenever you want, and just keep giving that address to different people. You have to generate a specific invoice for a specific amount. There are some proposed changes to get around that, um, but for now, that is one difference in the experience that you will find different. For example, if I wanted people to give me um, donations, uh, gifts on Lightning, uh, the same way that people can give me gifts on Bitcoin. With Bitcoin, I have an address out there. It is published on my website. Everybody knows what it is. And if somebody wants to give me a gift, they could just take that address, send whatever amount they want, and that's a gift. If I wanted to do that with Lightning, if I wanted people to be able to send me Lightning gifts, I would actually have to do a couple more complicated steps, at least in the current state of the technology, whereby I have a form on my website, they type in the amount they want to do, they press submit, I have my Lightning wallet generate an invoice, and give them that invoice on the screen, and then they can send the Lightning payment to it for that amount. So it's a bit more complicated from that perspective. In terms of sending, it's almost identical to a Bitcoin wallet. You scan the QR code, you hit send. That's it. Um, or you scan the QR code, or you paste the address, which in this case would be a Lightning invoice. Very, very similar. You wouldn't be able to, to see a difference. Ideally, I'd like to see a user experience for wallets that combines both Bitcoin and Lightning wallets into one. There's no reason why you should have two different wallets. 
um, you should be able to have one wallet that can either make payments on chain with Bitcoin or make payments off chain with the Lightning Network. And if you scan a Lightning invoice, it does a Lightning payment. If you scan a Bitcoin address, it does a Bitcoin payment. Um, there are even some proposals to include both. So you scan a Lightning invoice, and if that isn't working for you for whatever reason, you can have a fallback Bitcoin address to do an on-chain payment. Um, and it looks really identical to um, any other methods that, that might be used. So you could have one interface to do both. Um, I think that would be ideal. Um, there are some minor details that you want to carefully abstract in the user design. Now, the second part to this question is, what is the difference between a Lightning node and a Lightning wallet? Um, and really, at the moment, there isn't much difference, because um, most Lightning wallets are actually uh, full Lightning nodes. Um, and just like in the early days, uh, of Bitcoin, and then in the early days of Ethereum as well. If you wanted to have a wallet, you downloaded a full node implementation, and you had to sync a full node in order to have a wallet. And we didn't have lightweight not wallets. Uh, lightweight wallets that use a node that's somewhere else um, didn't exist in the early days of Bitcoin. And now we're in the early days of Lightning. Most Lightning wallets are closely coupled and attached to a Lightning node. Now, theoretically, you could separate the key management capability of a wallet from the network management uh, um, and protocol of a node, and you could have your wallet talk to a node to uh, get information about the network, but sign uh, transactions on the wallet only. Uh, so you can eventually separate these two um, elements of the architecture. Uh, but for the time being, almost all of them are uh, one thing. So every wallet is a node today. Um, we'll see how that changes in the future. There are a few web-based wallets, um, but again, those are hosted wallets. In which case, you're not running a wallet or a node. Um, that's somewhere on a website, and somebody else has the keys. And guess what? In Lightning, just as much as in Bitcoin, your keys, your coins. Not your keys, not your coins.